I'm glad y'all can make it this Memorial Day uh, weekend. Um, hopefully you got a, a nice party to go to afterwards uh, to kind of celebrate. We are in um, a series called Broken Religion, and we're talking about uh, different ways that folks uh, view religion and their criticism of it, uh, some merited, some maybe not so merited. And so today we're looking at this whole idea that religion is a result of culture. That religion is a result of culture. So maybe you've heard this, you know, you're only a Christian because you were born into a Christian family or country. So that's why, that's, that's why you're a Christian is because of your family, you're a Christian because of your, of the, you know, you were born in the United States, but, but if, you're, if you were raised or born somewhere else, uh, you wouldn't be a Christian. It's got nothing to do with God, it's got nothing to do with what's true, it just has to do with, you know, culture and where you're born. So uh, maybe you're a Christian because you were raised in a Christian culture, but if you were raised somewhere else, you would be Muslim, or raised somewhere else, you would be Hindu. And it really just has to do with where you were born. Now, there's, a, there's an element, I guess you could say, of truth in this, um, in that um, if you look at most religions, you can almost tell where they started. You just look at where they're really strong, and you just kind of follow the circle to the middle. And generally, you get pretty close to where they they started. It's kind of like if you, you know, when you throw a, a rock into a, a calm pond, right? The biggest wave is the first one, and then it waves out. But by the end, it, you know, it peters out. Um, the further you get away from the source, and for the most part, if you were actually to look at the world's uh, religions, you would see something very similar uh, to this, especially some of the Eastern religions, because. Um, a lot of the Eastern religions, what you worship are your ancestors. So obviously, uh, your ancestors are different than my ancestors. And my ancestors are different than your ancestors. And so we're not going to worship the same ancestors. And so they are very, very localized. Um, and that's kind of where the criticism comes up. However, a lot of times you'll hear this um, um, usually from like a professor in college telling his students this. He's, he thinks he's being really smart, making a great point, right? And then, of course, his students will, will use this statement, and you see it online, and da-da-da-da-da. Um, I'm not pointing fingers, but it kind of lacks a knowledge of, of the truth. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because there is a, there is a un, un, generally, you could argue this, and you'd be right. But there is a phenomenal, great exception to this rule. And so uh, with that in mind, I want to track the growth of specifically the religion of, of Christianity, followers of Jesus and its growth. Now, I'm going to spend too much time on this. This is not going to be a history lesson. But I do feel like because you are, you know what, what Malcolm was saying, you are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so my telling you this isn't to convince you. I'm assuming most of you are already in. I'm, I'm telling this so that if you ever have someone say this to you, you have a response that you can share. Okay? And that's, and that's why we're going this. Not for a history lesson, not for you to go, ah, right? But so that, so that you understand, oh, this, this, is, this comment is not based on a solid foundation. So let's just start with, Remember that center of the pond? Let's start with where Christianity, Christianity started. Okay, so I have a map here of the missionary uh, journeys of Paul. Now, technically, Christianity was uh, born uh, with Jesus' movement, most, mostly, actually, I think exclusively, in the area of Jerusalem and, the, and Israel of that day. He did not travel outside of that. So that was the beginning of Christianity. But the one who spread it, and it's commonly accepted by both uh, Christian scholars as well as secular scholars, is this guy named by the name of Saul, whose name was uh, Paul. And you can see these are his four missionary journeys. All you need to know is that it's mostly what we now consider the Middle East, Israel all the way up to uh, Italy and Greece, that area right there. Okay? So here's the thing. If religion, especially Christianity, is a result of culture, 
okay, then Christianity should be, start here, and you should be able to see this wave, and it just kind of dies out the further it gets. Because Christianity, therefore, is a Middle Eastern religion. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look up online and you go, what's the difference between Western religions and Eastern religions? Okay? And you'll get all kinds of different things, but generally speaking, Western religions, you're going to love this, are monotheistic, which means Muslims are Western. Yeah, I know. You never hear that because they're always, you always hear down with the West, right? Well, th and that's the problem with language. But technically, when we talk about Eastern religions, they are, they are polytheistic, many gods, and they have their source in, in Asia. And Western religions have their source, are monotheistic and have their source in the Middle East, and so the birth of Christianity, which, of course, you could argue the birth of Christianity was really with um, Adam and Eve, and then, and then if, not, if nothing else, Abraham, which is, by the way, what they say, because both uh, are three, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all trace their roots back to Abraham. So they're Abrahamic, so Middle East. So that would be its natural culture. Are you following me so far? Okay? These aren't disputed facts. These aren't disputed facts. That's where Christianity started. So let me take you to a map of where Christianity is today. Okay? Now, I didn't come up with this map. This is actually um, from PBS, which is not a Christian broadcasting service. Public broadcasting service. As a matter of fact, by the way, this map and a couple of the research things... I put a link in the app. You know, remember you have the, the notes in the app? The link to this is there. So you can do your own research. I don't want you to trust me. Do your own research. But let me share with you the research I found. This is a map, according to PBS, of the prevailing beliefs of religions around the world. Okay? It doesn't mean everybody inside of color is that religion. It means that the majority of people inside that country, so let's say the United States, which is purple, the majority of people, 51% plus, say that they are identify as Christian. Okay? Now, if, if, if it's culture, right, the belief is, you know what, you live in America, therefore, therefore you're Christian. Okay? And because most people have never left America, right, and all our movies stereotype everybody else, then you're, you're going to think, well, yeah, it's, it's just because I'm an American. But if you look at the map, are the Americans, North Americans, anywhere similar in culture to South Americans? No. 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 Do, are South Americans anywhere near culturally what South Africans are? Or Russians? Or Australians? No. Talk about vast and different cultures. So to, to say that Christianity is monocultural is not to understand reality. This is what it is today, right now. When, they, when the secular scientists do their research, this is what they, they find, that the, the vast majority of the world is Christian. Now, I happen to think they're not all Christian, that there is some cultural Christians. I'll admit that. Right? Just like there's cultural Buddhists, cultural Muslims, cultural whatever, wherever you live, there's some culture in it. I'm not, gonna, I'm not arguing that. Okay? But what I am arguing is it's hard to say. You, you, you notice what's not purple is where Christianity started. Now, I bet you could tell me, I bet you could tell me with a pretty good guess where Islam started. I bet you can tell me with a pretty good guess where Hinduism started. I bet you can tell me with a pretty good uh, uh, guess where, um, well, Buddhism started. Why? Because those are the colors. The one thing that does not follow that trend is Christianity. Matter of fact, the, the area that Christianity really started in, you can't really see it because it's really, really small. It's, it's dark blue. It's Jewish. And then everything around that you'll see is Islam. And so forth and such forth. So, so the idea, the idea, the map does not bear out that the idea 
that you're only a Christian because of your culture doesn't... Empirically, that's, that's ridiculous. Because talk about... I mean, I don't think you can get a more vast contrast of different cultures than where all the purple is right now. Those are vastly different cultures. Plus the fact that it's that the original culture of Christianity isn't even really represented by the map of who's currently Christian. Now, that doesn't mean there's not Christians in those areas. And by the way, it doesn't mean that there's not folks following Islam and other in the purple areas and other religions. You know that that's not true. This is just statistically in terms of the majority. Right now, the places that Christianity is growing the fastest is Africa and Asia, the areas that are not purple. That's the fastest growing place that Christian, uh, Christianity is growing. In 2000, there are 660 million Christians called um, from Africa and Asia. That they called Africa and Asia their home. 660 million. Today, in 2022, now, you know, you got to take all these numbers, just like, you know, what they tell us on TV with politics and everything, with a grain of salt. Okay, but with that said, in 2022, almost 1.1 billion Christians live in Africa and Asia alone today. Almost double in 22 years. This, the green and, and uh, semi-purple and orange area. So let's talk a little bit about where, statistically, where is it going, okay? Same map, because we don't know where it's going. I'm just going to use the same map, but where is it going? Now, again, let me just say, no one knows for sure. We're, I mean, no one can predict the future. Whoever predicted the future in 2019 was dead wrong when 2020 hit in the pandemic. Nobody saw that coming. I mean, I'm sure somewhere out there, there was a conspiracy theorist that said someday something like this was going to happen, right? And that's the whole idea that even a broken clock is right twice a day, right? And so, um, but for the most part, we cannot predict the future. All they do is they look at current trends, and they project based on current trends where things may go. So nobody knows this, but this is what they're saying. This is what their best guess is, and again, it's a guess. And uh, again, I'm going to tell you some statistics by Pew Research. The link is in, your, is in the app. It's in your notes, so you can double-check this yourself. All right, the world's Christian population uh, between, um, actually, I think this was between 2010 and 2050, is expected to grow from 2.2 billion, that's 2.3 right now, to 2.9 billion uh, people in, uh, in, 20, in 2050. All right, nearly one in three worldwide, n- n- I'm sorry, nearly one in three people worldwide in 2050 are expected to be Christian. Okay, now that's just a little bit more as the share today. But remember, that's keeping in track with the population explosion. Here's, here's the thing that kind of makes you go, hmm. By 2050, 38% of the world's Christians, 38%, that's a huge number, is going to live in sub-Saharan Africa. Even today, by the numbers, there's more Christians living in the continent of Africa than any continent in the world today. So by 2050, they say that that 38% of the world's Christians will live in sub-Saharan Africa, 23% in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, and there's going to be a reduction to 16% in Europe, 13% in Asia and Pacific, and notice this, and only 10% of the world's Christians will live in North America. That includes Canada and all of North America. And so as we, as we kind of look ahead, what we actually begin to see is what when, when you're told it's cultural. In your mind, what you're supposed to believe is, <clears throat> you know this white, dominant, male, ugly culture that we have in America? You're only Christian because of that. Because this is... But what we're, what, we're gonna, what we're seeing, what it's already moving to, and what we're definitely going to find is that culture is going to be the minority culture of where you find Christians. You want another interesting fact? You can read this yourself. Um, by 2050, atheism is going to be reduced. 
in the world. It goes up in the United States, but it goes down in the world because that's where the trends are going. Atheism is almost growing flat. It's not actually growing at all. Now, you live in the Bay Area, so you probably think, oh, man, everybody's going to be an atheist. And the world's coming to an end. Da, 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 da. But that's not the world picture. That's the Bay Area picture. That's the Bay Area picture. According to LifeWay research, again, this link is in, your, is in the app, as Christianity grows to grow in the global south, so not America south, global south, so South America, South Africa, the global south, um, it's going to be increasingly less concentrated where you have this culture, I guess you could say, a lot of Christians all together. So notice this. In 1900, okay, 19, 123 years ago, 95% of all Christians lived in a majority Christian country. So what that, all that means is, is that if you had a country where the majority of people, 51% plus of the people in that country were Christian, 95% of all Christians worldwide lived in one of those countries. Are you following me? Okay, today though, today only 53.7, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do pastor math, 54% of, of Christians live in a country where the majority of the people are Christian. So just barely half. They predict by 2050, who knows, that most Christians, over 50%, almost 51%, that most Christians will live in a country where the majority of people are not Christian. So that means most of the Christians are going to live in countries where it's not part of their culture, it's not accepted, it's not, by the way, a lot of this green and purple and, and orange, especially the green and purple, it's illegal to be anything but those two religions either atheist or Islam, which is, by the way, one of the reasons the numbers are so high, because you're not even allowed to say anything else. But what, what the statistics show is that even with that being the case, Christianity, the followers of Jesus, is growing in its impact. Christianity, quite frankly, the stats are clear. Christianity is multicultural and growing so every year. Christianity is not a result of culture. As a matter of fact, Christianity transcends culture. And you can go ahead and say, well, that's pastor talk, right? Because I'm in a church. Of course the pastor's going to say that. That's why I presented to you facts that you can go up and look for yourself. You can go look it up for yourself. But let, 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 I do want to say that history has shown over and over that follow, those who follow Jesus are not bound by geography or culture. We heard that with Philip and the eunuch. We're truly a, a worldwide religion, which is at the very heart of the original message. And I just want to look at that really briefly here. So Paul's uh, writing a letter uh, to non-Jews because it all was birthed out of Judaism and, and the children of God. Jesus was a Jew and all 12 of his followers were Jewish. But now the message has started to go out to the non-Jews. So, so the word Gentile, that's all Gentile means is non-Jewish. You're the Jewish or you're non-Jewish. Okay? And so he's writing to a non-Jewish, mostly Gentile church in Galatia. And he is basically laying out this, this argument that you cannot confuse, unlike what historically it has been, following Jesus with a culture. And he says this in Galatians 3, starting verse 26 through 29. You're all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for in you for you, I'm sorry, are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So in this paragraph, what we basically have is we have three statements about what you all are. And it concludes with an if-then statement, okay? Don't worry about that statement. I'm going to walk you through it, okay? Here's the first statement. For you are all sons, and by the way, implied, because language has changed, and daughters, for you are all sons and daughters of God. So he's writing to a, a gathering of followers of Jesus, and he's saying to them, 
You are not Jewish. You weren't raised in the synagogue. You have not been, by one of the signs of, especially among men, of, of being Jewish is circumcision. They had not been circumcised. They had not been, uh, uh, they had not converted and been, been baptized into the Jewish faith. Right? But what he's saying is, despite the things that you have not been done, you are sons and daughters of God. Why? Through faith. Faith means that I, I'm, I believed and put my life into something. In what? Christ, which by the way, remember, that's his title, not his last name. He's the Messiah. He's the King. Jesus. So all those who put their faith in Christ Jesus are sons and daughters of God. That's the first you, you are. You are all. The second one he says is, for you all were baptized into Christ. Or for all, for, I'm sorry, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Okay, so now he's talking about the way they live. It's not just their faith, but how is their faith played out? As he's identifying the children of God, this is how their faith was played out. First of all, they were baptized. Now, does that mean physically baptized or baptized by the Holy Spirit? I'm going to just say yes because there was no difference. As soon as you heard with the, with the, the eunuch, okay? This is one of the reasons why we ask folks to, to be baptized after repentance is because everywhere in the Bible that we find where it says, um, how do we be saved? The answer is repent and be baptized. Baptism follows repentance, okay? Now, there are other places in the Bible where it says that so-and-so who repented and was baptized, that their whole household was baptized. And so there's a lot of denominations that go, well, the whole household was baptized. It's probably kids. They could be right, right? But when it's explicitly said, it's repent and be baptized. And when you repent and be baptized, guess what? The Holy Spirit comes into your life, comes in your heart, right? And then if the Holy Spirit's in your life, guess what? You no longer live like you used to live. You, well, remember a lot of my messages, I'll probably end today by going walk in the dust of the master. And that whole idea of walking the dust of the master is I'm walking so closely by Jesus, behind Jesus, he's kicking up this dust. So at the end of the day, if I did my job and just did what Jesus did, I'm really dirty and dusty. And this is that same idea. It's like putting on a new pair of clothes. And in the, in the Roman society, you literally, when you became an adult, you took off kid clothes and you put on adult clothes. You're now a Roman citizen. There's a special clothing for citizens. In Judaism, if you were to convert to Judaism, you needed to be literally baptized. Go in. And matter of fact, even today, some of our Jewish friends will tell you, if you're, if you're committing or you're recommitting your life, in a lot of uh, synagogues, you go in, you take your clothes off, you are baptized, and then you put your clothes back on. And, but now you're Jewish if you were to convert. So that's that picture. That picture is what I once was, but now I am. And when you make that decision and the Holy Spirit comes in your life, you are now a son and daughter of God. The first, uh, there are, I'm sorry, the, the third y'all, I guess you could say, for y'all comes at towards the end of a statement here. For you all are one with no difference. For you all are one with no difference. You're one in Christ Jesus. And what precedes that is, what does he mean by we're all one? He gives us this list. He says, we, there's neither Jew or Greek. There's neither free or slave. There's neither male or female. Now, you got to ask yourself, okay, what is he saying here? Does he say that we're, there's no distinction? All those things are gone all of a sudden, which some people say. And I, the scriptures don't actually teach that. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time teaching it, but I'm going to jump really quickly to 1 Corinthians 7. We'll come back. Verses 17 through 24. Uh, this is Paul's advice to a church. He says, Nevertheless, each one of you should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him or her and to which God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. In other words, this is what I ch tell churches to do. Was a man already circumcised? That means Jewish. Okay? When he was called, he should not become uncircumcised. Now, obviously, you can't become uncircumcised. Uh, maybe in today's world, we, there's so much that we can do. But uh, in this time, and most of the time, you cannot become uncircumcised. What he's, what he's basically saying is this. If you were born into a Jewish family where you ate kosher 
and you Jew and you and you celebrated the Jewish holidays, continue to do that. Then he goes on and says, was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. In other words, you don't need to follow all the Jewish customs. You don't, need to, you don't need to celebrate the Jewish holidays. You don't need to go to synagogue on Saturday. You don't need to. Because in essence, he's saying, verse 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's command is what counts. So what he's saying here is, is this. He, he doesn't say, you know, Jew, Gentile, they don't even matter anymore. You're, you're, you're a third thing. He doesn't say that. He says, if you were born Jewish, remain Jewish. Why? Because he wants Jewish people to reach Jewish people. And he wants people who were born in, into the Roman society to reach people in the Roman society. Just like, by the way, if you were uh, uh, our Christian missionaries who were meeting with folks who were, grew up in Islam are saying, don't all of a sudden throw the law away. Islamic law away. Don't. Live that way. As long as it doesn't contradict God's word, live that way. Be a light. The only difference is, is that you now know that Allah has a son. You now know that he died and that no amount of trips to Mecca, no amount of, no, no amount of great works is going to get, no amount of jihad is going to get you to have an only sacrifice through Jesus. So aside from that fact, the rest you can practice as long as you don't violate that, but, but remain in your culture. This is one of the reasons that Christianity spreads. He says, interesting enough, talk about controversial, verse 20, each one should remain in the situation where he was and when he, God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Now, slavery is a little bit different in this context, but it's still not a great thing, okay? Um, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, do so. In other words, slavery is not for, and most people, by the way, sold themselves into slavery. Somebody didn't sell them into slavery. It's a different form of slavery. Anyhow, verse 22, for he who has a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. In other words, you are free before the Lord. Similarly, he was a free man when he was called in Christ, uh, is a Christ slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. In other words, don't sell yourself into slavery. Brothers, each man as responsible to God should remain in the situation God called him to. Okay, so let's go back to the passage here. So there, there's no difference, right, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. It does not mean that, that, that there should be no, there's not male anymore, there's not female anymore, there's not, there's not American anymore, there's not Russian anymore, in terms of, of how we daily live our lives. What he's saying is it's in regard to worth. You know what's interesting about this? It's really easy to, to miss because of our culture. We don't have this cultural background, okay? So he compares Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, males or females. If I was a free Jewish man, I have to actually be that, but if I was a free Jewish man in the first century, I would rise up and I would pray this prayer. Are you ready? You're going to love this. Praise be you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, because you have not made me a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. Can you imagine? Now, I already preached. You guys know that that was my heart. So don't be too hard on them, because I had to repent, and God has changed my heart in that regard as well. But So what, what he's saying is, you know, there's this, there, there's this religious idea that there's those who are in and those who are out, and, I'm, and I thank you, God, that I'm in and not out. And what Paul is basically saying is, that's not the way God views the world. Now, does he see that some people were raised in Israel and some people in the United States, absolutely. Does he see that some people were born male and some people were born female? And he, does he have directions for male and female? Absolutely. It's in the scripture, right? Are there, are there, are there some people who are bosses and some people who are employees or, or in some parts of the world master slave? Absolutely. But before him, there is no difference. And he actually explains this in the last statement. Here's the if-then statement. Okay, the if then, it's in verse 29. If you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, now that's the qualifier. You must belong to the Messiah. That goes, that, that goes back to the beginning, those who were immersed in him and are clothed with him. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. In other words, a relative of Abraham. 
a relative of Abraham. And by the way, that may not actually be a direct. Uh, uh, those from the Arab nations and those from the Jewish nations are literally descendants of Abraham. But he's, what he's spiritually saying is, is that, is that if you believe in Christ, you are an heir of Abraham, and therefore, this last sentence, and you are therefore heirs, in other words, you have full inheritance, full inheritance in the kingdom of God, according what? To the promise given to Abraham, that, he, that God would bless him, and he would be a blessing to all nations. It's, it's about worth, not about whether or not you're this or that. It's about worth. So in God's eyes, there is no, males are not worth more than females. And people who are born in the church, or born religious, are not worth more than were not born religious. And that, and that those who have high gifts and are free and, you know, whatever, are not worth more. Beyonce is not worth more than me. I mean, financially she is. <laughs> but not in God's eyes. In, in God's eyes, anyone who's a follower of Jesus, anyone is an equal heir. And just the fact that we're heirs, kind of like, you know how Corey got choked up when he was thinking about the blood? That should choke us up. Can you imagine? I always just want you to imagine this, okay? We all enter into glory, and all of a sudden we see and understand perfection clearly. So we all are going hit to our, hit our face and just go, we are not worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Now think about this. Then the Father, Father says, you are not only forgiven through my son Jesus, but everything I have, I have an inheritance. And you are not going to get an equal share to whoever your spiritual heroes are. But you, in essence, are going to be a co-heir, a co-brother or sister to Jesus himself. That should floor us. I am not worthy. See, Christianity isn't a result of culture. Christianity is a result of faith. Christianity is a result of faith. The gospel, the good news, transcends culture. And by the way, so should our love for people and our outreach should transcend culture. We need to see the world as Jesus does, one universal family. Trinity Church is not the church that Jesus has. It's one place that his family gathers, and they gathers all over the world. And there is no more favor for Trinity Church than there is for a church that's meeting in Haiti, that a church that's meeting in China, that a church that's meeting in Russia, that a church that's meeting in Iran, Vietnam, China, wherever. Everyone needs salvation. Everyone needs Jesus. I'm just going to want to leave you with this picture that the Bible says when the end of days comes and he looks into heaven, this is what John sees, Revelation 7, 9, and 10. John says this, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, too numerous, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne in the front of the Lamb, the Lamb is Jesus. They were wearing white robes, which we don't deserve, but we got because of Jesus, and holding palm branches in their hands. And they, this multitude from all these nations, from all these tribes, from all these different people, from all these different languages, cried out in a loud voice, salvation, being saved from, from what we deserved to what God's gift is for us. Salvation belongs to our God. It's not mine. I didn't earn it. I wasn't born into it. It's not my parents. It belongs to our God who sits on the throne. In other words, he should rule our lives. And, notice the equality there, not just God, and to the Lamb. Christianity is a result of faith, not culture. As a matter of fact, <laughs> The, the interesting thing about Christianity is the more the culture fights it, the better it grows. You want to know why Christianity is dying in America? Because it embraced it for so long. And embraced it so long, so you know what Christians began? We, we began to think, ah, you know, the Christian life is going to church and the free economics of America. 
And we began to confuse the culture with Christianity, which it never has ever been. And so we stopped fighting. And when we stopped fighting, we stopped living by faith. When we stopped living by faith, our faith dies and the church dies. But the more that's perse persecuted, which is why it's growing so fast in Africa and China, the more it grows because it brings freedom. A freedom that no one can take away. It's relational. It's with the God of the universe. Amen? Amen? Father God, you know, this is one of those messages I feel, Lord, that we could shake our heads yes in our head but can never reach our heart. And it's not just about believing that, that following you is multicultural, but I think it's, we, Lord, we need help seeing people that way. When we, when we walk into a, a, a store or in our neighborhood, dear Father, or wherever we are, then we don't see um, hoodlums. We don't see Indians or, or Asians or white or black or young or old. But we begin more and more to see with your eyes, Lord, People like ourselves that need Jesus. That whatever language they speak, no matter how low their pants may come off of their behind, they are loved and cherished by you. And you want them to come unto yourself, dear Lord. Whether their politics are blue or red, you died for them. And you want someone to say, God loves you just the way you are. Just like he took me just the way I am. That we may model that you don't keep us there, but that we don't have to clean up. We don't have to become American. We don't have to become Republican. We don't have to become respectable. We don't have to become anything to come unto you. But you'll take us just as we are. We know that's true of you. Could you make that true of us? Would you change our hearts that the world may truly know that we're disciples by the way we love the nations, the people from different political spheres, philosophies. Would you do this in the name and the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ? Amen. Amen. With that, I'd like to bless you. So if you, if, uh, you can stand, go ahead and stand. And we'll uh, end with a blessing. My blessing is simply this. It's twofold. May you be blessed with the knowledge that despite your unworthiness, you are fully received. And may you be blessed by sharing that same attitude with all those you come in contact with this week. Go and walk in the dust of our master, Jesus Christ. God bless.